humble ourselves now as we pray, renouncing every sin and wicked way, we lift our voice, seek your face and say, Lord, send the rain. with us this evening we get started this evening we just want to thank everybody for making it a priority to come to the house of the Lord tonight and if you will bow your heads and let's pray Lord Father God we thank you God for this opportunity to join together in your house God we ask God that you will do what only it is you are able to do and that is to meet the needs of your people and I pray that you accept our worship in the name of Jesus we pray amen In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come gather together to lift up your name, to call on the Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifting on your wings.
Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We welcome you all, and we thank you so much for coming and being here on this Sunday evening. We just had a great crowd this morning, and I got a good-looking crowd tonight. It's good to have my friend, Sister Jenny Douglas, with us from the flat ground of Wynn, Arkansas, and no hills over there. <laughs> but we're glad. We're glad to have her pastor of the Lighthouse Church, and we're just honored to have her. Normally, we take up offering right now, but we're going to wait. We're going to take up offering. After a while, she's going to be telling about her ministry, the, the Lighthouse, and, uh, and so we're going to wait until just then. But we just want you to continue to worship. Go ahead, jump in, and let's worship the Lord, and then we'll move on from there. Go ahead.
storms are raging. He is my rock of ages. I know it. He is able. Mighty is He. We threw a march round the walls of Jericho. They knew that they would fall. God told them so. Just like He worked for them, He's working. seated at this time. We make our announcements that I went over this morning. Uh, first of all, we um, we just appreciate each and every one of you, as Pastor said, coming, being a part of our Sunday evening service, and I uh, got a great, great looking crowd. All right, April the 2nd, Children's Church is having a connection night from 3 to 5 here at the church, and the primary class involved in that too? No, okay. All right. Uh, so Children's Church, heads up, listen up on that, 3 to 5 on April the 2nd. And uh, hey, kids, it's a good time to invite some friends, if you got some friends, to bring with you for that. All right, April the 8th, 9th, and 10th, uh, Brother Torrance and Brother Mario Nash is going to be here that weekend. Friday night uh, will be Youth Revival. Uh, Brother Mario will be preaching that night. And uh, we're just expecting great things during this weekend. And, of course, Saturday night. And Sunday, Brother Torrance will be taking those services. And uh, so continue to be praying, please, about this revival. Invite somebody to come to be with you uh, during this. And I know that you'll be blessed uh, indeed as well. And also, this morning I may mention it is time to start bringing in candy, individually wrapped candy for uh, the Easter egg hunt that we will do uh, coming up on Easter. So uh, if you can pick up a bag of individually wrapped candy, will it be very helpful? We'll have uh, a place in the back to put it. So uh, dollar store, Walmart, wherever uh, you choose to get, just make sure it's individually wrapped candy. And uh, so I'll, I think that's all the announcements I have. Wednesday night, don't forget uh, Bible study. We're going to pick right back up in Romans class. And uh, so come and be a part of that. Bring you something to write with. Take some notes. And, uh, and just uh, come expecting to receive from the Lord. Amen. All right, any more announcements we'll make at a later time. Kersey, would you come? I'm just going to go with her. Through the 
years. Lord, I'll look on this moment, see your hand on it, know you were here. And
Anybody going through anything today? feel like you might be at the end of your rope right now. You might feel like you're going through something that you just really don't know how it's going to work out. You know, there was a man standing at the foot of the mount whenever Jesus began to come down. His only son had been demon possessed. He already went to the disciples and nothing happened. He's already been there and he, he was about to give up. There was nothing left for him he thought he could do. But then Jesus come down and he said, Master, 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 my son, my son, he is being tired by the day. And all Jesus had to do was say, you perverse and faithless generation. He said, do you even believe? He said, I believe, but help thine unbelief. You know, the things we're going through right now, they might not even be able to see, we might not be able to see the end of them. We might not be able to see how they're going to work out for our good, That's even right. though the Bible tells us, oh, everything's going to be, but just, just excuse me for a minute. I might be the only one right now going through something. I might be the only one that it just seems a little bit hard. I might be the only one that's been praying about a few things. Might be the only one that has thought about giving up lately. I don't know. But I can tell you for certainty right now as they begin to come back. It's all part of my testimony. Because one day I'm going to be able to look back at it. And I'll be able to say, oh, he helped my unbelief. Oh, I, I know that I am able to believe. But you're going to have to help my unbelief right now, Jesus. Because this thing, it just, it just seems way too big. 
Oh, I know I'm not saying it like I need to right now, but I know that there's people in here right now going through these things. I know there's people that just don't know how to go through this. But I can tell you, if you will take the hand of Jesus, He will help thine unbelief. He will help you and give you the strength that you need.
Amen. While they continue to sing, I don't want to overlook it. The Lord's already done a work. Thank the Lord. If you need a touch in your body, we want you to come. We're going to ask God to touch you and to heal you. Whatever it may be, we want you to come. The anointing is here. So we want to agree with you tonight and pray for you. Just sing whenever you feel, wherever you need to be. Church body, would you come help us this evening? Every breath I breathe, let the rain of your presence fall on me. Everywhere that I go, let your presence flow.
amen and amen. Father, we love you tonight, God, and we're thankful, Lord, for the moving, the operation of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the lives that you've already touched, God, and the things that you've already done. For everything, God, we're grateful, and every work that you do is a great work, God, and we just thank you, and we give you praise for it tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Thank you, singers and musicians. You may be seated this evening. Don't you appreciate your singers and musicians tonight? Amen. They're a blessing. Definitely a blessing. Amen. Well, again, we're glad to have you here tonight. I'm very thankful of what the Lord has already done. Amen. And uh, God knows exactly what we need, and we just appreciate you surrendering and letting the Lord touch your, touch your life tonight uh, already. But we, uh, it's an honor tonight to have Sister Jenny Douglas with us. I've known Sister Jenny for some time, for a few days. And uh, it's a uh, I'm just uh, glad to have her here this evening. She pastors a church in Wynn, Arkansas, the Lighthouse, and uh, has got another ministry that they have started. And I want her to come. Faith Worship Center, would you let Sister Jenny know that you appreciate her being here this evening? Brother Steve knew me back when I had black hair. It is a joy and a privilege for me to be here tonight. I, I don't feel that I'm worthy to stand in this pulpit. I look over here at these men of God and who am I? Who am I? But brother, when you were talking a while ago, you touched my heart. You see, because like David, I can say I was young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. Amen. There have been so many times in my life that I would think, God, where are you? Are you working? Are you moving? Are you going to hear me? Are you going to answer? But as time would go by, I could look back and I could see the hand of God working and moving. Even though it was not known to me at the time, He knows. And I can tell you that He will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, put your hand in the hand of the man that steals the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man that calms the sea, the one that can see you through, that can get you to the other side. He's the one that you want to put your faith and your trust in. You can't trust in man and you can't trust in yourself. But you can trust in Jesus Christ. And what he did for you on Calvary's cross is enough. And you are are going to make it. Hallelujah. 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 As I said, it's a privilege to be here tonight. I don't take it lightly, Brother Steve, to fill your pulpit. I do not take that lightly at all. I know how we have to be so careful who we trust in our pulpits. And so I, I take that as a great honor and a privilege to be here tonight. As Brother Steve said, I pastor a church in Wynn, Arkansas. It's called the Lighthouse. We're getting ready next month to celebrate our four-year anniversary. There's been many, many times, brother, in this last four years, I didn't think we was going to make it. I didn't think we were going to make it. I was telling the sister before church, and I promised an evangelist friend, friend of mine I'd quit saying this, but it's the honest truth, and I'm not uh, just saying this, but you be an over middle-aged woman in the Baptist Bible Belt and try to start a church and be Pentecostal and be associated with Jimmy Swagger. I'm telling you, it's been an uphill climb, but I know what God has promised us and I know what He has told us Amen. and I know what He has raised up our church to be and I'm holding on to that. Amen. And I am holding on to that. But I'm here to talk to you tonight a little bit about another ministry that we have started called Lifehouse. Lifehouse is a recovery home for women. And just to give you a little bit of background into myself and how that came about, I don't want to take too much time. God has moved in such a way tonight. I could leave right now and say it's been good to be in God's house. But about, well, about 2014, I guess, God began to deal with my heart about a ministry for women. And so I didn't know what he wanted me to do, and I didn't know how he wanted me to do it. But he laid it upon my heart over a period of a year or two of praying about that, 
to have some women's retreats and some women's conferences. And long story short, in the spring of 2016, I had a first women's retreat. I didn't know how. I didn't have any church backing. I didn't have a budget. I had nothing. I went on Facebook and I said, I'm about, I'm going to have a women's retreat. Who's interested? It had six states represented in that retreat. Women came from six different states. And I'm telling you that God moved powerfully. Before the weekend was over, they were asking me, can we have another one in the fall? And so I started having these retreats. But later that year, I was at work. I'm a retired registered nurse. And I was uh, at work, and a hospital in West Memphis had closed. Crittenden Memorial Hospital had been closed for some time. And so we were told that they were going to put a women's prison in where that hospital was. And just as clearly as I've ever heard the Lord speak, he said, I want you in that facility. I started making some phone calls, and I started seeing what I needed to do to get in. They weren't even open yet. But in November of 2016, I went over and I held my first service. I think I had 70, 50 or 70 women. The altars were full as they worshipped, as they heard the word, as they received the word. And I left there that night. I didn't know what to expect. I thought, who's going to come? Who's going to listen to me? What do I even do? I, I'd never done anything like that before. Don't be afraid to step out in faith when God calls you to do something and he lays something on your heart. Don't be afraid to step out because he will equip those that he calls. And as I started in the prison ministry, and the, the chaplain there is 100% behind our ministry there. He supports it. And he tells the women, you need to come because you know what? He sees the results in our services. And I've had the women tell me themselves, I'm going on my sixth year in that prison. And I've had the women tell me them, themselves, there's nobody else that is like you. It's not because it's me. It's because of the Holy Spirit in me and the truth that I have in me of Christ and him crucified and that his blood is enough for everything that we need. Oh, in our service this morning, the Holy Spirit spoke through tongues and interpretation and said there is power in the blood of Jesus for everything that you need, everything that you need. Put it in the faith in the blood of Jesus and it can take care of it. And that's what I preach to those women and they respond to the truth and and he is moving in their hearts and lives. Not long after I started the uh, prison ministry, I started going into the county jail. And I believe y'all have a jail and prison ministry, don't you? If, you're, if, you're, if you don't and you're not involved, somebody needs to pray about doing that. It's so rewarding. But I started in our county jail. And I mean, it was a totally different atmosphere than the prison. There was a darkness... There was an oppression. There was a spirit of darkness over our county jail. The people were mean. The workers were mean. They treated me like dirt. There was times I would leave and I think, I'm never, I'm never going back to that place. But see, that's what the devil wanted. I had my family and my church praying. And it took about eight months to a year, but I began to see a little light began to penetrate that darkness and God began to move in my services in the jail. And I have seen countless women give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Now at the prison, I have women baptized in the Holy Spirit almost every service, eight to ten women, almost every service. But at the jail, it took a while. But then I started stepping out in faith, brother, and I started asking God to fill people with the Holy Spirit. And I've had four or five or six women in the last year baptized in the Holy Spirit in the jail. And I'm telling you that power of darkness has lifted off that place and there's a whole different atmosphere there now. It's not because of me. It's because of the truth that's being proclaimed and they're finding out that they can be set free. and They don't have to live in those circumstances any longer. I hadn't been going there very long, and I began to see the same women over and over and over again. They'd be, I'd get them in, and they would cry and pray, and they would worship, and I would pray with them, and I would see them beginning to grow, and they'd be released, and they'd go back out into the world. They had nowhere to go, most of them, except right back where they came from and in the environment that they came in. And very soon, God began to speak to my heart about a home where I could bring some of those women and I could disciple them 
in the truth and teach them the right way and how to live for God. And they didn't have to go back out into the world that they were in. I have prayed about that home for over five years. So if God gives you a vision and God gives you a dream, don't give up on it. Don't give up on it. After we started the church and it it seemed like God just wasn't going to move in that area, I kind of did. I just kind of thought, well, maybe I didn't hear from God. I was going to put it on the back burner. And I'm just going to let it go. And I said, Lord, if you want this, you're going to have to, of course, you're going to have to do it anyway. But if you want this, you're going to have to do it in your own way and in your own time. And I proceeded on about two years. Nothing. All of a sudden, last summer, God put somebody in my path. We began to talk, and I began to feel that stirring and that kindling in my spirit again, that this was something that God wanted. And I remembered I was in prayer one Monday morning. I was in prayer, and I remember the Lord speaking and said, Call about Valley View Baptist Church. It had been closed for about four years. I checked on it before. I checked on it when we started our church, and the, the preacher, had, the pastor had told me, I don't want to get rid of it. We, we've got plans for it. I'm going to open the church back up. It's, it's not available. So I said, Lord, it's not available. He said, check on it. So I called the former pastor, and I told him what I was wanting to do and that I needed a place to put this home. And I said, I know you told me before that Valley View is not available, but ha- has that changed? Has any? He said, well, I believe that just last week the Lord told me it was time to do something with it. I said, well, I'm in town. Would you meet me there and let me look at it? I got there before he did. The back door was standing wide open. I walked in and I literally had to fight the spider webs to get through that building. One room was so bad I took a hole in there in case there were some vermin or some snakes or rats or something. But I walked in that building and I felt the Lord say, this is your house. He got there and we walked through. The sanctuary, everything was intact. They walked out one Sunday and that was it. They'd never been back. It was just closed up. I said, would you sit down and let me tell you what's on my heart? We sat down on a pew. I just began to share with him just what I've shared with you. Tears started to roll down his face. And I said, what are your thoughts? He said, I think God's in this. And with Holy Spirit power... And and boldness, which I don't normally have like this, because I don't ask people for things, not for myself anyway. I said, would you give us this building? He said, yes, I will. He went and got the keys and handed them to me and said, it's yours. (laughs) That's the kind of God that I serve, ladies and gentlemen. That's the kind of God that I'm served. When he's in it, he will provide for it. I'm just a backwards country girl. I've never done anything like this. I've never tried to raise funds. I've never gone out and talked to people and tried to get people on my side. I'm not the most popular person in Cross County, Arkansas. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just not. But I went on the radio. And I started putting out the word, what we were trying to do. The Lord laid it on my heart to send out some letters to four or five different pastors that I know through Facebook. Some of them I never met. And God laid it upon this pastor, that pastor, this pastor, one in Phoenix, Arizona, one in Rochester, New York, one in Denver, North Carolina. Different places that God began, Clarendon, Texas, that God spoke to these pastors And the church, North Valley Assembly of God Church, wonderful pastor Scott Thurber preaches the cross, preaches Christ and him crucified, loves the message of the cross. that's, That's what their church is about. They have supported us. He has gotten behind us. He has helped us in so many ways. But that building needed a lot of work. So I go up there to start cleaning it out and trying to start getting it ready. And I'm just cleaning and pulling and tearing down drywall and I'm saying Lord I'm not doing this I'm not doing this you're gonna have to send somebody to do this I'm not able to do this I'm not doing the whole time I'm working and I'm crying but guess what we're looking at eight eight months later and I'm still up there doing it (laughs) 
I'll tell you something else. I thought I had a, a live-in resident supervisor. God sent this person. She moved down here from another state. She lived with my husband and me for four months while we were trying to get the house ready. I thought she was the person God had sent. I truly, I still believe that she was, even though I was seeing some things. She went back to her home state for the holidays and never came back. So here I am with a house that's almost completely renovated, ready to start taking in women to disciple them, and I have no living supervisor. So I said, Lord, I'm not doing it. I'll finish the house. It'll sit empty for a year, two years. I'm not doing it. I've got a husband. I've got a family. I'm the pastor of a church. I'm not doing it. But guess what? I'm doing it. Don't ever tell God that you won't do something because he'll show you real quick that you just might do it. Right now, and, and I said, when he told me, yeah, you're going to be the one that moves in there. I said, okay, Lord, I'll do anything you ask me to do. I've picked up hitchhikers. I've put myself in dangerous situations. If God know God tells me to do it, I'll do it. I said, Lord, you're going to have to speak to my husband. And when I bring this up to him, you're going to have to help him to be able to see this as you. And when he says, when he says, no, you're not doing that, I'm not. Two days later, I didn't even get a chance to say something to him. He said, you know what I've been thinking? I think it'd be better for you to go ahead and just move in over there and get this thing going and get it off the ground. I mean, I've talked about smacking me upside the head. I've talked enough about that. But anyway, Life House is a recovery home. It's based, it's a faith-based discipleship program for women that have life-controlling issues. My goal is to keep women out of prison. Over the last 12 months, I've lost six to eight women to prison who I have seen God working, truly working. They're getting hold of the message of Christ and Him crucified. And I've seen them beginning to have their lives transformed. But because they had appeared before the judge too many times, they've been sent to prison. Had there been a home, a place where they could come, I could have prevented those women from going to prison. Most of them I still are in contact with. They write me. They call me. They're still walking with the Lord. They're still living for him. They're still doing all they can to get through. I see that jail is a revolving door, and I know that they need a place to go where they're safe and where they can learn and where they can grow. Now, I've had it said to me a lot of times, oh, everybody gets jailhouse religion. Well, no, they don't. Not everybody wants to hear the truth, and not everybody responds to the truth, but those that do, that God truly gets a hold of, I've seen lives being transformed. They don't know how to live for God, though, once they get out. There are those that have come from the most difficult circumstances. So many of the women that I deal with have been abused as children. They've been molested by their fathers or their, a relative or a family friend. They go from one bad relationship to another looking for love and for acceptance. And most of the time they end up on drugs and on the streets just trying to survive. There's only two ways a woman can make it on the street. There's only two ways. She sells drugs or she sells her body. And I can tell you they hate it. They hate it. They despise themselves. They hate what they've become. And they know that there's a better way. They just don't know how to get there. It's very difficult for them to start a new life with no help and no job and no money and no home and no stability. That's where Lifehouse hopes to step in. And make a difference in these lives. These women have some church background. A lot of them do. A lot of them have been saved in the past. But like so many, they've not been taught how to properly live for God through faith. Many, many times I'll ask the girls if they have a church background, what would your pastor, the pastor of the church you grew up in, what would he say to you if you went and said, you know, I know I'm saved, I love Jesus, I gave my heart to the Lord, I know he's changed me, but I still struggle with drugs or bad relationships. What would your pastor say to you? Every single time they say, well, you've got to try harder, you've got to stay in church more, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. I say, wrong answer. Right. Wrong answer. They need to know and be told how to live for Jesus. Lifehouse is going to be a very different type of program. I have met and talked to a lot of different, uh, several different directors of homes, of faith-based programs. They all resort to works. 
They teach them faith to be saved, grace, you can't earn it. And then they start telling them what they need to do, what they need to do, what they need to do. And you and I know that Christ and the blood that he shed on Calvary is all that they need to be set free from those things. It just last summer, it seemed that God started moving and doing such great things. And then here I am. Here I am, you know, in the, in the position that I'm in. And the things that I have been faced with over the years. And that song that y'all were singing, the one that you sang through several times when Brother West came out. That was ministering to me so much because I have been there so many times. And I know that God will come through for you time and time again. The greatest need that we have for LifeHouse right now is your prayers. It's the greatest because we can't do anything without prayer. We can't do anything. I need your prayer. I, I personally, my husband and I both need your prayer in this endeavor. We need you to cover us in prayer. If you have a prayer list at the church, I wish you'd put us on it and leave us there. Lifehouse, just leave us there because we need the prayers of the people. But we also need donations. We need monthly donations, particularly at this point because the, the renovation is almost through. There's still lots of things that we can do, and we need a privacy fence terribly. We have wonderful neighbors on the east of us, but they're like old McDonald's farm. They've got everything, their, their hogs get out and get in our yard and their dog, their three-legged dog runs over and tries to, you know, bark at everybody that comes up and, you know, and not only that, they keep a slew of foster kids and I just feel like it would be better to have a fence. We, we need a fence, but there's things that we need like that, but right now, the main thing that we need is monthly support. I've been asking churches to please consider picking us up as a missions a home missions effort, a home missions project. I have come up with a rough figure of about $800 a month that it's going to cost to house one woman per month. And we're going to house up to eight right now. So it's going to, as you can see, it's going to, it's going to cost a lot of money. I don't have it. If you've never read George Mueller's book on how he ran the orphanages in England on simple faith, well, that's, that's an inspiration to me. That's what this whole thing has been, is by faith, and God has provided. He has brought us probably $80,000 in the last seven months. $80,000. Is that not amazing? And that old building is just eating it right up. <laughs> Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 25. I'll try not to be long, Brother Steve. He asked me if I would go ahead and preach. This is a little bit different message for me, a, a pastor of a church. You know, I, I preach uh, like any pastor would. And uh, I don't, haven't preached on this passage before ever, but Matthew 25. I, was, I said, Lord, what can I bring? What word can I bring that will help convey my heart for LifeHouse? Your heart for these women but this still will also minister and challenge us. And he brought me to this passage, Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we uh, saw thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels, for I, have, I was a hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they answer also unto him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then he, shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, 
he did it not to me. Father, I thank you for the precious word tonight. I pray, God, that you would help me. Lord, I ask you to enable me. I don't have one thing to give these people. Only I can only lead them to you who is the answer for all things. Father, let the Holy Spirit flow through me right now. Let the anointing and the unction of the Spirit fill my mouth, Lord, to minister and to touch these people's hearts, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that this passage is referring to Israel in the tribulation period and the treatment of the nations toward her. Jesus is speaking of the sheep nations that will support and protect Israel and the goat nations that will align with the Antichrist in trying to destroy her. God will judge these nations and reward them according to their dealings with Israel. During that time, Israel will be hated by much of the world and that tiny little nation will be attacked and she'll be driven out under the threat of persecution. And those nations that minister to her in her time of trouble will, will be rewarded of the Lord. But those who make her trouble harder will be banished to a lake of fire. God cares, folks, what happens to his people. He cares. And no matter what the enemy brings against you, and no matter how much he tries to buffet you or discourage you, God sees it, and you don't have to go, and you don't have to fight that person on your own behalf. You just sit back and let the, let the Lord do your fighting for you because he can do a much better job than we can. Amen. So you trust him when you're going through a difficult time. Amen. But God cares what happens to his people. I believe with all my heart that God keeps a careful record of how we treat those that are less fortunate, those that are hurting, and those that have fallen on hard times. I believe that. It seems like the Lord has such compassion for those that others despised and rejected. And I'm telling you today that these women that I deal with feel despised and rejected by much of society. Those We need to come to those that have fallen on hard times. Those that need a hand up to pull them out of a hopeless situation and offer them hope in Christ. Those that can't seem to get out of the pit and sometimes they've dug that pit for themselves. But they get down in it and they want out of it and they need somebody to reach down a hand. Say, let me set you up here. Let me help you find the solid rock where you can have a firm foundation. Right. I believe, yes, if those people will turn to the Lord and cry out to him and surrender their lives, he will move mountains on their behalf. Right. He can make their crooked paths straight and set their feet on a firm foundation, the solid rock, cross Jesus, and he can work miracles in them and he does but so many of them don't know how to get there they don't know how to trust him they don't know how to call out on his name they don't know how to put their faith in the right object I can tell you from my experience that God chooses people like you and like me to be his hands extended I don't know why he chose to involve man in his affairs. I don't know why he chose to let us be his mouthpiece and to be his feet and go where he wants to go to get his work done. But he does choose us. And perhaps it's to test our obedience. Perhaps it's to keep us humble before him. Or perhaps it's so that we can enjoy the rewards of seeing someone's life turned around and someone life's, someone's life changed by the power of Jesus Christ. There's no greater reward I'm telling you, there's no greater reward on this earth than to see a life changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, let me tell you just a minute about Ora Lee. Ora Lee came in the jail. I don't know how many times over the years I had Ora Lee. She was a street walker. She sold drugs. She sold her body. She was homeless much of the time. She would come in the jail. She would get saved. And I would minister to her. And I would talk to her. She would get out of jail she'd go right back because she had nowhere else to go but then COVID hit she got sent us to prison but I had seen God really working in her this last time that she was in jail I saw that she was truly getting the light was, was shining and the light bulbs were going off and she was beginning to understand that it's by faith and grace faith and grace so she was Send us to prison, but because of COVID, the prisons weren't moving people in. And she sat in the jail for a solid year. 
by the divine hand of God. I had one year to disciple her and to minister her to her and to speak into her heart. And I got so tickled because she's a big, tall woman, big, much taller than I am. And I called her my little missionary. She became a missionary in that jail. And those girls would come in and she'd set them straight real quick. Oh, no, you're coming to Bible study. You're going to read this Bible with me. We're going to pray together. And she would come in. She'd say, Miss Jenny, I have this question. I just don't understand. But I think it means this, this, and this. And I saw from that she was getting it. She was getting a hold of the truth. Right. Finally, last uh, summer, the uh, administrator at the jail called me. They were all familiar with her. She'd been in and out, in and out for years. He said, Miss Jenny, I just want to tell you something. He said, I took Orly to prison today. He said, I'm telling you, that woman is in a good place. That woman is like I have never seen her before. He said, you have done a remarkable work with her. I said, oh, no. Oh, no. I haven't done anything except to lead her to Jesus. I said, but he has done the work. Orly's still in prison today. I just got a letter from her the other day. Oh, Miss Jenny, I have so many questions. I wish I could just get out and talk to you and ask you questions. But I know I will one of these days. But I'm holding on. I am holding on to Jesus. He is my answer. I know that. Oh, I've seen countless women come to that place. I'm a firm believer, though, that all Scripture, even though this is about Israel, whether it was written concerning Israel past or future, or if it's a naturally occurring event in the Word of God, that it has a spiritual implication that can be applied to our lives today. I believe that because the Word of God says that the Bible, the Word, is quick. It means it's alive and it's active and it's sharper than a two-edged sword dividing the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And it can touch our hearts and it can change us. I'm so thankful. But it can be applied to us. And while this passage is futuristic concerning Israel, I believe we can see what God expects from us and the treatment of our brothers and sisters in Christ and also the strangers in the land. The strangers in the land, that's where most of these women fall. Verse 35 and 36, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I don't see any of us here. I'm looking at myself that look like we've been starved lately. I don't see any of us that look like we've been starved lately. But we all know what it's like to be real hungry. To get out in the hot sun and work. And we forget to drink and hydrate ourselves and we become dehydrated. Our blood sugar lowers. We get the weak trembles. And we feel like I've just got to have something to eat. I've just got to have something to eat. And what do we do? We forget all about our diet. And the first cupcake, the first Pepsi, the first thing that we see, we grab it. Or I don't know about y'all, but I start gobbling it down. I just get it down. I remember one time I was on a real healthy eating plan and I, 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 was, I didn't eat sweets at all and I was just real, just really, really rigid with it. And I had bought for my husband a little package of miniature cupcakes. And I got home and they were on the counter. <laughs> I hadn't had anything sweet probably six or seven, eight months. And I thought, you know, those are just bite size, not much bigger than a quarter. I think I'm going to have one of those. When I came out of my sugar coma, I had eaten that whole package of cupcakes. See, when we're real hungry, we don't care what we're putting in our body. Even though it may not be healthy, it may not be the best thing we're putting in our body, but we don't care. We just want something to fill our belly and to satisfy and slake our thirst. That's exactly what happens in the spiritual. People are dying from spiritual starvation. Their lives, nothing but broken cisterns, that hold no water, they're dried up and wasting away with no real life, looking for something, anything to bring them relief for the longing of their soul. John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. 
As Christians, you and I know as saints of God, we partake of the bread daily and we drink from the fountain of life daily. He is the one who sustains us and nourishes us. But if we don't know Christ or we're living outside of his will, we're living in failure and defeat, then I can guarantee you we're trying to fill that void with anything that this world has to offer. And that's where these people are today, whether it's alcohol or drugs or illicit relationships or work or play or money or entertainment or sports. I am so sick of the entertainment in this world today. And what's called entertainment is straight from the pits of hell. And most of it is not worth watching or putting your time or money or effort into because it is destroying this nation. I didn't mean to say all that. Whatever it is we're searching for, the world will supply it. But it's going to be the wrong thing. So many of the women I deal with are searching for a better life, a free life. But no one has really led them to the bread of life or the living water. They've been teased with crumbs, but they have not been taught how to come back daily to be refreshed by placing faith in the precious blood of Christ on a daily basis. And they are frustrated and broken. Have any of you lived your Christian life frustrated and feeling broken until you came to the understanding and the knowledge of Christ and Him crucified that His blood is sufficient for all things? Then He says, I was a stranger and you took me in. My mind goes back to the Exodus, the night the Paschal Lamb was slain and the blood was applied to the doorpost and the death angel passed over. When the children of Israel left Egypt, there were strangers who joined up with them and said, I've seen the power of your God and I want to go out of this place with you. I have seen. What, are this, what does the world see in you, ladies and gentlemen? Does what is the people you work with see in you? What do people at the grocery store see in you? Do they see anything in you that they would say, I want to leave this land of bondage that I'm in and I want to go where you're going oh that God would change our hearts to the degree that the rose of Sharon would permeate from our very soul and our very being and that we would walk into a room our countenance would be such that people would say I want what she's got I want what he's got oh that we would be changed by the power Amen. several times in scripture we see the Gentiles coming to the Jewish leaders seeking refuge and alliance, desiring to leave their own kinsmen, their home, to be under the protection of Jehovah. I think of Rahab, who recognized the power of the God of Israel, who asked for safety from the invasion of Jericho. The scarlet cord was let down from her window when she and her household were saved. Never do I see a time when a person sought refuge in sincerity, that they were turned away. On the contrary, they were taken in and treated as one of their own. But sadly, I've heard time and time again from these women that they have felt when they walked into a church rejected. I had a woman tell me one time, all anybody ever had to do was know what my last name was. I knew what she was talking about because from just a kid, I knew that last name. All anybody had to know was I was one of those kids. She said, I've been looked at. People have looked down their nose at me. She said, I don't even go to church anywhere because I'm rejected because of my name. Oh, let me tell you, sister. You can have a new name that's written down in glory. And nobody is going to be smirch that name or take that name from you. Oh, I have a new name today. I woke up this morning. I don't even know why. I thought, Lord, what's my name going to be in glory? <laughs> have you ever let your mind go, what's it going to be? I don't care what it's going to be. I don't care what it's going to be. It can be my real name. I don't even care. They say I've been in church I've been in church all my life. I grew up. I grew up in Pentecost. My great-grandparents, well, I'll put it this way, my mother was born in 1917, and she was born into Pentecost. So that's how far my roots go back in Pentecost. I've been in church a long time, and I can tell you I have seen 
people with that same look of disgust on their face when somebody walks in that doesn't look like them or smell like them or doesn't know how to act in church. And you don't think for one minute that these women, when they walk in and they've just been with five men the night before trying to survive and they walk into a church building that they can't feel and sense the demons coming at them. I'm telling you today... I'm going to say something, and I'm not saying it to you directly. I'm talking about the church, universal, what calls themselves the church, because I know you're an awesome church. You have awesome pastors, and I can tell by the Spirit of God that is here, this is an awesome place to be. If I didn't have a church, I'd be driving to Portia. But it's time, I'm going to say this statement, it's kind of bold. It's time that the church gets off her high horse and starts getting down to the nitty-gritty. It's time that the church gets their hands a little bit dirty. There's a lost and dying world out there. People that are misguided and wandering aimlessly amidst all the troubles and the trial and the chaos in this life. But they, when there is one who seeks shelter, we need to be ready to receive them and love them and teach them and disciple them in the ways of God. So many people want to They say, oh, I want to be minister. I want to be in the ministry. Oh, I have found out, Brother Steve, in the last four years, unless God... God has called you and you know without a shadow of a doubt you don't want to be standing behind this pulpit. You don't want the, the what comes at you daily. You don't want that coming at you daily. I'm telling you, I told somebody, a friend of mine the other day, Sister Lynn Parker, she's a pastor of an Assembly of God church, loves God with all of her heart, preaches the truth. She's a wonderful, wonderful friend. And we were talking about some things. I said, Lynn, I'm either insane or sold out because nobody in their right mind would subject themselves to the things that I've been subjected to am I here to moan and groan about what God puts us through no I count it all joy to suffer for the name of my Savior the one that gave his life on Calvary's cross and shed his blood for me I count it all joy to be persecuted I count it all joy to be laughed at and mocked and when pastors stand up and tell their church people don't you listen to that woman she should not be behind the pulpit she's not credible the Bible says she cannot preach well, I'm here to tell them today I can preach by the power of the Holy Spirit in me. And he is the one that called me. I'm telling you, and it wasn't a conference call, Brother Steve. They weren't on that call. But I'm here to tell you today when God calls you to do something, brother and sister, get up and do it. Get up and do it. Hallelujah. They want to minister, but they want ministry tied up in a... And pretty paper all wrapped up in a pretty bow. They don't want to go out in the pig pen and take the prodigal by the hand. They don't want to get their hands dirty. But sometimes we've got to get up and go. What we have inside the four walls of our church is wonderful. What a blessed time. But you know that church is for the believers to come together and to be strengthened and encouraged. We are to win them out in the marketplace and then bring them to church. It's not your pastor's responsibility to go out and win everybody. What county are y'all in? County. Like Lawrence County. It's not your, it's not your, pa, it's not your pastor's responsibility. We have a responsibility to take the gospel to them. Sometimes we've got to go, we've got to touch, we've got to leave our comfort zone, we've got to walk where Jesus walked. Then in verse 36, he said, naked, and you clothed me. Oh boy, oh boy. There's a lot of naked folks walking around out there today trying to cover themselves in the fig leaves. There's a lot of naked folks standing, standing before God who sees all. There's, there's sin exposed before God. They think they're covering their sin and shame. They're hiding it from everyone else when in reality they are broken and bruised and battered inside from the sin in their lives. All they need is to come to Jesus and place their faith in his finished work and let him slip his beautiful, perfect, 
white robe of righteousness over their shoulders. Oh, we can exchange our dirty, filthy rags for the righteousness of King Jesus. And we get to wear His righteousness when we come to Him. But you know, there are so many that don't understand that. I had jail service last week and there was a new lady in there. Her name was April. I never had her in a service with me before. And when I walked into that, she walked in. You could see the despondency, the dejection, and the worry all over that woman's face. She looked like she didn't have a friend in the world. One of the ladies asked me about how Lifehouse was coming along, and I began to share, and I saw her perk up. And I saw her begin to pay attention, and she said, oh, I want to come. I said, are you willing to give up 12 months of your life? She said, oh, yes, because I'm going to go to prison if I don't. As the service went on and I began, we began to sing, we began to worship, that woman broke down in sobs, cried her eyes out. I walked back to her. I didn't say anything. I just put my arm around her and began to pray for her. As the service went on and I began to minister and bring the word, she cried and she cried and she cried. But by the end of that service, her, service, her countenance had totally changed from one of despondency to one of hope. I walked over to her. I said, you have, you have peace. Your, your whole countenance has changed. She said, I have peace for the first time in many, many years. I said, I can see it on your face. I can see it in your countenance. See, that's what Jesus can do. 12-step programs, 21 days of this, 40 days of that. It's not going to do one thing for you. It's going to make you hungry. It's going to make you searching more because you're not going to be satisfied. The only answer is Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross. That is the only answer. And when a person starts getting a hold of that truth and you see those light bulbs begin to go off in their mind and you see the transformation begin to take place, I'm telling you it's the most beautiful sight in the world. These people are hiding their shame, but they can have the righteousness of Christ applied to their heart. And then you know what? They are able to come boldly before the throne of God. Whether it's in prayer or praise or petition or worship, they can come boldly. These women don't think that they're worthy to do anything. That they're able to do anything. They've been so beat down and rejected and beat upon and hurt and abused. I had one tell me, she said, go ahead and get your house open. This was several months ago. I said, it's not ready. All the windows are broken. I don't even have, most of the windows are broken out. I've got fan blades taped to cracks and, you know, just all kinds of stuff. She said, I don't care. I've slept in dumpsters. I've slept in the dumpster. It don't, it don't bother me to come there. I just need a, I just need a place to go. Y'all, I, I don't know any of you. I don't know where you've been. You, you may can identify with everything I'm saying. Most of us cannot. We cannot identify with sleeping in a dumpster. With not having any electricity or running water for months at a time. With sleeping in somebody's shed or going from couch to couch. Whoever will let us stay until they get tired of us and they kick us out. Families that have turned their back because they've used them and they've stolen from them and they've to support their habit and they've abused their parents in so many ways. I've, I've had parents tell me, I wish she was dead. I have had parents tell me that. I called a dad for a woman one time. She said, please call my daddy and tell him I got saved. I called him. He said, I don't want to hear anything about her. I don't want her name mentioned to me. Don't ever call me again. Click. Aren't you glad that no matter how ornery we are, no matter how many times we walk away from the Lord, no matter how much we take up and partake of that's not pleasing to Him, that we can come back. That we can come back. He's never going to cast us away. He's never going to turn us away. He's never going to say, you've gone too far. You've done too much. I don't love you anymore. But these women, some of them have heard those words from their own families. It's heartbreaking. But then on the other hand, when you see the things that they do, you can kind of understand it to a degree. That's because we're in our humanness. We see what it does to us. 
But when we think about what it did to Jesus, put him on, him on the cross. Right. Part of the sin that he died for was yours, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Just as guilty. Just as guilty. Who's going to explain to them faith and grace? Who's going to lead them to victory and freedom in their living? Sadly, most of the modern church doesn't understand themselves how to live in victory. And they're faltering and stumbling and failing and sinning and shame. It seems like every day... It seems like every day I read of another pastor that's called an adultery or pornography or molestation or has, has committed suicide or is leaving the ministry and some are renouncing their faith. There's an epidemic in the land and it's not a pandemic of COVID-19. Right. This is an epidemic of false Christianity and counterfeit Christians Whoa. and heresy and all kinds of untruths that are being spewed from the pulpits in America and around the world today. But we have got to come back to the basics. We've got to return to the old paths. We've got to lift up Jesus and Him only and serve Him with all of our hearts because ladies and gentlemen time is running out there's not much time to do what we've been called to do in these last days these women just like you and me need Jesus they just need Jesus just like you and I do you can have this world brother Steve you can have this world give me Jesus give me Jesus then he said, I was sick, and you visited me. I'm trying to hurry. Jesus said, the whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. The world is sick today, and the church is sick today. The whole head is sick, and the body is covered with sores. And people are going around with their heads in the clouds, oblivious to what's going on around them. Oblivious to those, and so unconcerned. I was looking at a house last summer that I thought about trying to buy and remodel as I was beginning to search. And again, the Lord said, just sit back and let me do it. So I looked at one house. But I was talking to the realtor, and I was telling her what I was wanting to do. I was telling her about the jail ministry and the women and their lives. She looked like a deer in headlights. And do you know that she said to me, I had no idea there was anything like that going on in Cross County. I thought, woman, where have you been? The, the lady that had come from Washington to, that was going to help me with this that ended up not, but she'd gone around to some of the pastors in town. A church that I attended for 32 years, now this man wasn't the pastor at that time, looked her in the face and said, Wynn doesn't have a drug problem. And I said, it's probably a good thing that I was not in that meeting. Because I probably would have told him, you get outside of your four walls, buddy. And you get down there in that jail and you get you a ministry going down there instead of sitting right here in your comfort zone and in your cushioned seat in your office and you get out and you see what's going on in this world, you're going to see that wind has a huge problem. And as little as Portia is, I'm telling you today, Portia has a drug problem because it's everywhere. Then he said, I was in prison and you came into me. How many of you know that there are worse prisons than a building with steel doors and barbed wire fences? As bad as those places are when the soul of man is bound in sin, held captive by Satan with such strongholds, with chains so tight that he cannot break himself free, and his very breath is slowly being exterminated from him and being squeezed out of them. Who's going to tell that prisoner where there is freedom to be found in Christ Jesus? Turn with me, if you will, very quickly to Luke chapter 4. Verse 18. This is Jesus coming out of the wilderness experience where he was tried and tested. Beginning his earthly ministry, he went into the temple. He took from the book of Isaiah. And he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them which are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. These are the words that he said. As he began his earthly ministry, this is why he came. To preach the gospel to the poor. This is not those 
This is not talking about those that don't have any money in the bank. This is those that recognize that they are poor and broken in their spirit and that they need a Savior to heal the brokenhearted, that heart that beats within you that you feel like has been crushed into a million pieces, the hurt and the pain that you've experienced in your life that no one could ever put your heart back. But I'm here to tell you today, He can bind up the broken heart and He can make it new. It can heal every hurt and heartache in your life. <laughs> he came to preach deliverance to the captives. These are those that are bound. Do you, do you name sins here? Is that okay? Name sins. He came to set the homosexual free. Right. He came to set those that are caught up in drugs and alcohol right. free. Those that are bound in pornography. Right. He came to set you free. Those that are bound with racism, right. hatred, bitterness, jealousy, right. envy, unforgiveness. Do you know that those hidden things in your heart can bind you and keep you from where you need to be just as much as somebody that's living a blatant sinful life out in the open for everybody to see? Those little things that you have hidden in your heart that you think nobody sees, I can guarantee you that God sees. And if you will let Him shine His spotlight down into your heart and reveal to you everything that is there, we would be surprised sometimes at what we find what he, when we allow Him to search us. Oh, Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Is that your prayer today? Do you know that all of these things, first of all, he came to set at liberty those that are bruised. How many of you have ever experienced emotional hurt and pain? Verbal abuse. Someone putting you down constantly, telling you you're no good. Someone ravaging you in some way, making you feel less than a person. We have those bruised emotions. That psyche of man that is very easily turned in one direction or another simply because of what's happened to us. And I'm not into psychology. Don't get scared because I said the word psyche. But God created us as intricate beings. And the things that happen to us affect us. My father was not saved. He was a good man in a lot of ways, but he was verbally abusive. It has caused me much, much pain in my earlier life. To overcome those things. So I can't even imagine someone that has really gone through some stuff. My sisters and I have talked so many times of the more women that I deal with and that come into the church or, or that I tell their stories. We've decided that we had a fairy tale picnic childhood. We thought it was so bad. Folks, I'm telling you, you haven't seen anything compared to what some of these folks have gone through. But these are the reasons that he came. Just like he came for these women, he came for you to set you free from the things that you may have hidden in your heart. Just because they may not look like us or dress like us or smell like us doesn't mean that he didn't come for them too. And I'm going to go further to say this. If we live according to Galatians 2.20, if we are crucified with Christ and he lives in us and through us, then we're going to do everything that we can to bring others to this wonderful Savior. Because that's why he came. And if we're living our life through him, then that's why our purpose too is to bring others to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. He wants to use us. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. And as I said earlier, time is running out. Time is running out. We don't have much more time. There isn't time any longer to play church or to be so wrapped up in our own lives that we forget what we're called to do. It may be that God calls some of us to get out of our comfort zone, to deny our own privileges for the sake of others, to be more eternally minded than earthly minded. I, I used to hear that old saying, well, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I've never met anybody like that. Oh, God, help us to be more heavenly minded and eternity minded. We don't have much time. The ones giving, I want to, I want to say this to you because I know he's going to take up an offering and I'm not up here to beg for money. I'm not God as my provider. He lays it on the heart of people, and he has, and he has blessed us.
But I just want to tell you to the ones that, are, that give and provide for the work of God to be done, it's just as important as the ones that are going and providing it. Just because it couldn't be done without people giving. So the blessing is there for you as well. It takes everyone working together and sacrificing and praying in one accord to see the fruit of the labor. I want you to stand with me, if you will. There are two kinds of people here tonight. And I said, I don't know, I don't know any of you, but Brother Steve, really. I, I, I know none of you, I know nothing about you, but there's two kinds of people here tonight. Those who are trusting in Christ Jesus for all things. And those who haven't fully surrendered to him and you're stumbling in your sin or shame or in your walk with the Lord. Either we are living a victorious Christian life in Christ or we're living a defeated life. Now, that's just the way it is. One person is no better than the other. One has just found the answer and that's Christ and him crucified. When we place our faith in the finished work of Christ, his grace will flow to us freely and deliver us from Satan's snare. If you're here tonight, do you mind if I go on with an altar call? If you're here tonight, I know we've had a wonderful altar service, and I believe some burdens have been laid down. But if the Lord has pricked your heart, and you see that you're struggling with any stronghold in your life, Jesus wants you to set you free from that tonight. I don't care how much was laid down at the altar. There's still things that probably need to be laid down. But he's here to set you free. It may be things that you think nobody knows about this. God knows. You can fool your pastor. You can fool me. You can fool your neighbor. But you can't fool God. And there's no shame in coming. You may be a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years. There's no shame in coming if there's a struggle in your life. There's no shame. The shame is having the opportunity and knowing that Jesus can set you free and walking out those doors with the same struggle in your life. That's the shame. If you're here tonight and you're struggling with any stronghold, I want you to come and stand before these men of God tonight that they can pray for you, whether it's drugs or alcohol or it may be something more hidden, like I mentioned, pornography, unforgiveness, hatred, any number of things. All these things keep us bound. All these things keep us bound. I want you to come tonight. If you have anything that you need to lay down, I'm not one to prolong an altar call. I believe there's an, another altar call the Lord wants me to give. Maybe you are here tonight and you want to ask the Lord to give you boldness to be used to minister to the broken and the hurting. You want more compassion in your life. You want a bigger burden for souls. That should be all of us, folks. If that's you, if you want God to use you somehow to touch a life and a heart for Him, I want you to come and stand across the front of this building. If you ask Him to give you a burden for souls, I promise you He will. Do you know, I believe with all of my heart, that the signs of a personal revival... You can come to church and shout and jump and shout and, and dance and, and feel the goosebumps. But if you don't have a burden for the lost, you have not had a personal revival. A personal revival. You will have a burden for souls. You will grieve at any sin in your life. You will immediately feel the conviction and you will grieve over the sin. Pastor, if you'll come. Wadi, would you come? Pastors, help us. We're just going to pray general prayer. God, give us a burden for souls. If you would, bow your head and begin to pray already. And we're just going to ask the Lord to do that tonight. Father, we love you tonight. Oh, we thank you, Jesus.
If you're tired and you are thirsty, well, there is freedom. Oh, and if you're tired and you are thirsty, well, there is freedom. Come on, let's worship just a moment. Hallelujah. Showers of mercy and grace. Come on, sing this in, as you're up here. This, on on every place. Hallelujah. Well, there, there is, is freedom. freedom. Hallelujah. Come on, worship oh, with us just a moment. Freedom Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for freedom tonight. Of mercy, of mercy and grace. Falling, falling on every face. Oh, there, there is freedom. freedom. Hallelujah. Come on. Oh, with the Spirit of the Lord. Lord, give us a hunger for souls, Lord. A desire there for lost, Lord. Freedom. Hallelujah. Help us, God, to have compassion for those that are lost and undone, Lord. Oh, Hallelujah. The Lord is. Oh, there, there is, is freedom. freedom. Hallelujah. Oh, and if you're tired and you are thirsty, oh, there is freedom. Aren't you thankful for freedom in Christ tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Thirsty. There is freedom. There is freedom. Come on, sing it to it. Freedom reigns tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, Place. Hallelujah. With showers of, of mercy, mercy and, and grace. grace. Falling, Falling on, on every face. Oh, there, there is freedom. freedom. One more time, sing that. Hallelujah. Freedom in this house. Oh, freedom, freedom arranged in this place. place. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for freedom. Showers of mercy and grace. Falling on every face. Well, there is freedom. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. We come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the, the message tonight. And I ask in the name of Jesus that, Lord, that you would birth that desire and hunger in us like we've never had before. God, we must be moved by compassion upon those that are lost and undone. We must extend the same grace that has saved us and sa the same grace that has changed us to the lost and dying world that we're around. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would leave with that burden and with that desire. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, have you been blessed this evening? I'm going to let you make your way back to your seat as our ushers are coming. We're going to take up the, this uh, offering for the Life House tonight. Appreciate Sister Jenny coming and ministering to us this evening. It's been I've been blessed, I've been encouraged, and uh, we want to give. And I, I know what you're giving to, you know. I, I don't do this. I don't just call uh, people to come and we give to their work. I, you know me. I don't do that. If this was not something that, that I thought that needed to be 
given to and supported, then we wouldn't be here tonight. But we want to give as, as blessing the Lord and giving to the work of God uh, this evening, and that's what we ask you to do. Will you bow your head? Let's pray that God would bless this offering. Father, we love you and we thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to give to your work. And Lord, all we're going to ask is what you have already promised, and that is that you'd bless the gift, bless the giver, bless the life house. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Well, someday soon, with church I'm leaving, I'm going to a meeting right around that door. Well, I'm going to shout. But all my troubles are over Just as soon as I move To my brand new home Well, some people call me Well, they call me noisy Yes, I tell them I belong To a noisy crew Well, I tell them we shall When we get happy You see, that's the way we Christians do Well, someday soon Well, church, I'm leaving I'm going to a meeting Right around that throne Turn on the shout well, All my troubles are over Just as soon as I move To my brand new home Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. Sister Jenny, thank you for coming and sharing your heart with us tonight. We're going to be praying definitely for your ministry and, and may God bless that. God bless you for coming and being here tonight. Don't forget Romans class. Brother West will be kicking off in chapter 3, getting into uh, some true meat of it. And so come. Bring your Bible, bring your notebook, and let's just feed from the Word of God. We hope you have a great week. We hope to see you back Wednesday ready to worship the Lord. Brother Matt, would you pray and dismiss the service?